Lee. It's Heather with the Leadership Heart Podcast. And I am tickled pink today to have Brian Lord on with me. Um, he, somebody who's been in my space for a while, but I've been reading. He has this newsletter that he puts out on LinkedIn. You can also get in your email. And, and I've been reading it. And I'm not someone who actually reads a lot of other people's stuff, mostly because I don't have a lot of time for it. But it's always so interesting because he's interviewing just the most interesting people and then the spins on it. And even when he's not interviewing somebody, he's putting out a new spin on a piece or an article or something that just is really intriguing. And it's always heart centered. And just recently he put out a couple things that really just made me went, okay, okay. I have to have him on the show now. I think it's just um, some important things to talk about. So welcome, Brian. Hey, well, thanks, Heather. I'm glad to be on here. It's kind of fun to be on the other side of things. So it's kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Actually, that is fun. So for those who are listening, I actually was on a show that Brian is the host uh, for, and he did an amazing job. And it was in person. So felt really honored to to be on that show as well. What's the name of it again? Uh, well, it's the Beyond Speaking podcast and then the Borrowed Genius newsletter. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And so we'll make sure, and I'll make sure to link those as well inside these show notes. That way you can get access to those. But um, I, I do want to set people's expectations. My intro music is not nearly as cool as Heather's. <laughs> like, I don't have anybody singing or rapping about me in to intro. I mean, I don't know what they'd sing or rap about. Like, he needs to shave or <laughs> whatever. I don't know. But I just want to set expectations that it's going to be a drop off if you listen to it. <laughs> that, by the way, is a new custom song that wasn't on there. I've been doing my podcast. My podcast has been hosted for since 2018. And that custom song has only been in the last few months. So just so you know, that wasn't always that way. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Well, you've upped your game. You're continuously improving. Step number four on the Heather Younger. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We have we have to do that, right? That's what we have to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So so tell everybody uh, that's listening now, kind of where are you in your leadership journey? Because we always have a journey, whether people report to us or not. There's a journey, and what is that? What is that that you're on? I'm curious. Well, I mean, there's it kind of is an interesting story. I um, so when I was little, my mom would read to me, um, uh, and so it, you know, Solomon's choice was: do you do you want to have power, or do you want to have wisdom? So she really got that into my head as a little kid, which is more important, and I'd forgotten about it. And then years later, we had this guy who's an intern from China. And I was kind of thinking like, he goes, I, and so everybody in my company was doing business in China, but me, I was stuck here and uh, everybody was getting a Chinese name. And so I asked this guy, Hey, can I, can you give me a Chinese name? And I thought he'd just give whatever the Chinese, Hey, you're Bob, whatever the Chinese version of Bob is just, but no, he took it incredibly seriously. We did a two part interview, interviewing me about everything else, whatever. And he goes, so it's come down to these two things that are the most characteristic of you. And so their leadership and uh, which is power to him. So leadership and power are the same thing to him and wisdom. And he he was like, you have to choose. And then fast forward a few years later, um, I got to go on a mission trip to uh, Kenya. And it was this town that had not seen like Caucasian people, white people since 1964 when the British left. And so some people there spoke English, some didn't. I'd learned some Swahili to go out there and, and everything else. So it was this thing. And so when you're talking, really only men talk to you. So I would try to talk to the women. We'd hang out with them, but it'd be the men that would end up speaking. And at the very end of it, they uh, did they the women. So it was like the women's job to give you a name for their village. So you would get this. You have your normal name, but you also have like your village name they give you. And so the one that they gave me was... Mahoya. And so in Kikuyu. Um, and so what was neat for me, looking back on that in the Chinese name, the whole thing is, is that my mom said, always pick wisdom over power, always pick wisdom over leadership, seek wisdom first, and then the other stuff will come. And the cool thing was these women who didn't know me at all had only observed me for a week and a half in Burvian village going arrows. They did uh, Mahoya means wise leader. So wisdom first, leader second. And then when I'd done the interview with the guy, and of course, I'm not thinking about my mom when I was a little kid. His thing was, it, it meant wisdom and then leader. And it's, I'm going to say it wrong. It's like Luboro. So in my interview with him, so how I was seeing myself was the same as how these people who didn't know me at all saw me. And then what my mom had encouraged me when I was like six or seven to do. And so it's kind of interesting to see like from a leadership perspective, leadership will come, but you need to seek wisdom first. 
Mm, and it's so who you are. Like, I mean, I think that's the thing that it's like <laughs> most attractive about you is like when you go read the pieces or when you listen to interviews, well, there's like a level, level of curiosity there. But there's it, it, curiosity is a big one. I think that's a huge one I would define you as. But I think there's in the wisdom is huge thing. It, it's so true. It's like if you've been like this person since you were like five, let's say like curious <laughs> and like interview it like in your mind, like trying to find out more about these different people from all different facets and just like how they tick, like how it relates to you, like how it relates to the world, like those kinds of things. It's a, I think that's just it's very unique. It calls to me in a different way that I think, I think it, and it maybe, and I think those who like follow you or like listen to your stuff or whatever it is, it probably does that. It's kind of like, a, it's, it's kind of like knowledge for knowledge sake, but it's just like a, a real curiosity about like how people work and like why they do the things they do. Almost like a social scientist. That's yeah. actually what comes to mind. Well, it's so fun. Like it's life is so much more fun. Like I tell people, cause I am nerdy. Like I'm not running from being a huge nerd, but the thing is, is if you realize that everybody knows something more than you do, mm -hmm. like whoever you meet is going to be in the Mensa, they're going to be in their top percent, 2% of whatever that they are great with this, then you can learn something from them. And it's like the Ted, I don't know if you ever watched Ted Lasso, Ted Lasso yes. dart scene where he's like, those people weren't curious. They thought they knew everything. And they were kind of cruel because of it. And like that scene resonates with me so much because I'm like, it's so good to be curious, to just keep learning. And that that gives you some humility if you're always out to see, I can learn something from this person. So like when, I, when I've gone on mission trips, I never want to be the person in the front. Like we, you know, like, um, like we have the time, like we live near, uh, what's her name? Rosa Parks Boulevard. So she, um, uh, out here in Nashville. So like a lot of towns have a Rosa Parks Boulevard. And so her thing was sitting in the back of the bus. So whenever I go to different places, like do mission trips or whatever, I always want to be in the back. Now, sometimes it's hard because it's not like a, a thing that people are trying to be uppity and sit at the front. Like when you go and visit, you're helping people want to be like, you want to have the seat of honor. So it's not like a, mm -hmm. a negative thing, but I always want to sit in the back, in the back, bumpy part of the back of the pickup. And I try to learn the languages. So like like going to Haiti, like learning French. And so being able to talk to them and try and learn from them, like this guy is a math teacher. Like when you go, there's not some guy who's just doing labor. Like he's a math teacher trying to help these kids get better. And like, how does he teach? You know, what is his way of doing it? And because you have to be innovative if you're teaching in a village in Haiti on how to help these kids get better. And so you can have these people who are innovative, who are running CEO things, but you've got to be crazy innovative if you're trying to do stuff without truck parts or whatever, and you're trying to get food, like get rice from one place to another up the top of a mountain somewhere. And it's really fascinating to just be like, whenever you go somewhere, you can learn something. And it's so much more interesting that way than if you've got everything figured out. So true. And it's so funny because sometimes as I think about like whether you're leading a team, whether you're leading yourself, or you're leading community, leading family, whatever that is, like there is this sometimes smack on the face or swat on the backside <laughs> that says, uh, you better humble yourself because you're not the smartest person in the room. Mm -hmm. And I do think that because I'm a faith-based person like you are, like there's, sometimes it hits you harder than others. And you're like, I think I needed to learn that. Whatever that thing yeah. is, like I need to learn this thing. And I don't know if you're listening right now, but th th it's like this, this idea of, are you curious enough? Are you leaning in with wisdom first? Or are you trying to say like the power part? Do my, is my power and my authority more important? And I have lately been just really leaning into like, I really need you to put that authority stuff aside mm -hmm. because people are called to follow you for different reasons. Like I am with you, like, right. You, you can have whatever title you have and you can be doing whatever role you have, but it's like, it's the message. It's the congruency. It's the authenticity. It's the, like those other kinds of things that would f f like flow through or show from who we are that makes people go, Huh. Like they're curious enough to say, I want to see where this person's going mm -hmm. versus I have to go there because yeah. their title is X, Y, Z. And mm -hmm. they're at this level of hierarchy in the organization. And so I must follow that person mm -hmm. versus just being really like, I want to go because I'm super curious where this person's going next. Yeah. Yeah. And it's fun. Like I love learning from like cab drivers or Uber drivers, like different things and their stories and just you know, things that people go through. Like I've heard the craziest stories from those things. And, and for me, like, I love learning about different parts of the world or whatever. I mean, I talked to this one guy and I, I said, he was, he was from 
a town in um, Sudan. And I said, oh, is, th is that next to whatever town? Just because I just read a book on like the Blue Nile and the White Nile. And he starts crying. He goes, I've lived here 16 years. No one's ever known where I'm from. And I think it's Omdurman. And so he was, and he's like, he used to run this 400 person factory and his wife was the wrong religion. And she was going to get killed if they didn't leave. And so he came to the US and he's driving cars around. And um, like this guy with all his leadership. So it, it is crazy just being open to learn from people and you get to see a bigger world. Like you and I were talking before we got on camera about these difficult things. Like I've been bummed out because we were, we're trying to sell our house and we've had to get it painted. And we've had some slight inconveniences of not getting to our, our kitchen for two days. Then like other people like lose their houses and their livelihoods and their families. And we're like, how stupid is that of me to complain about not being able to get to my like chocolate ice cream, you know? So it's, it's just the, you know, just the dumb things that we do. Um, but it's also gives you an appreciation of kind of the world we live in and, and the people around us and that everybody's got stuff they're going through. Mm -hmm. So true. I think everybody needs a piece of us and we need to kind of be there to show more compassion towards other people. And actually I always, I know that I have a friend of mine who's like really into brain science and she used to always talk about like the dopamine and the different chemical responses and releases that happen, not only if we receive recognition or receive somebody helping us, but when we give to other people, how much, how those chemicals still do uh, secrete or release from our own brains. And so we're filled up more. So those people who say, you know, they really love service or like we do these mission trips. Um, <laughs> It's giving so like you know it, there's so much you're receiving mm -hmm. probably in more cases more than you're even giving as you go on those and so it's almost addictive you just want to keep giving you know yeah yeah and it's fun I mean and the other thing too is like it's like giving praise is an important thing and like one of the things we try to be more I know there's probably some business aspect we should have in this but just with uh, you know here at Premier Speakers so I work for a Speakers Bureau Premier Speakers Bureau I've been here 24 years and in the industry like 20 29 anyway. Uh, William Morris agency before that. And so um, like one of the things we try to be really good at doing here is praising others, you know, so that's, that's like built into our culture. We've, we have like a Slack channel for it. And like, I was on a call today, I booked you for a client in St. Pete a couple days ago. They're like, by the way, Heather's awesome. If you are thinking about her as a speaker, she's <laughs> awesome. They're like, she is and it does an amazing job of building in her content to our company. And they said, it's like she worked here. And so this is the one, I don't know if we can say it or not, but it's, it, the one in St. Pete a couple of yeah. days ago, yes. like she's awesome. They're also saying like Lori on our team is amazing. So Lori does our advance. She gets you kind of like my job is I help you get the speaker. She helps you get the speaker there. And they're like, Lori calmed us down. We have, because whenever you do events, that something goes wrong. Something's crazy. <laughs> you have to switch rooms or something up at the venue. And so, you know, like you make people calm. Lori does an amazing job with that. And so just when you have those things. And so like, the client told me that. And within a minute after getting off the call, I'd shot an email or a message to our whole team. Hey, Lori did this amazing job. So just building in those little things, as soon as you hear it, like be super aggressive at praise. And Lori's like, by the way, you know, I like when people say nice stuff about me. So she's obvious about <laughs> what makes her I'm like, Lori, it happens enough. You're going to be fine. But, um, but oh, like man. also letting people know what helps, what what makes you tick with certain things. So um, like building that in, like from a culture standpoint of just like, as soon as something happens, get it out there that this person did an awesome job or even things like people who don't, you don't hear about. It's like Diane on our team. Like it's really like Diane is somebody who collects money. So if we book you, she's the one who calls up the client, hey, send us money. And, but like fun stuff about her, she's got this miniature three-legged dog. Like it's seriously, it's about the size of this microphone. It's a three-legged dog, sits in her desk all day. We have a couple dogs here from here. And she is the world's best decorator. So like we come in for holidays. So it's oh. it'd be like some super minor holiday. I'm really surprised they're not like shamrocks everywhere right now. We're coming <laughs> up in March here. Um, but uh, the world's best holiday decorator. So we, it is kind of helpful to have a fun place to work where people encourage each other and um, and just kind of get along and, and hope everybody gets better. Mm, I love that whole, the embedding it. And I love the idea. Oh, I hope you've heard that everybody. The being super aggressive about praise. I've never heard of it quite that way aggressive because right? when you think about it like often what happens is we are super aggressive about telling people what they don't do well <laughs> <laughs> we're super aggressive about making people feel really tiny <laughs> and so what i talk about often with carrying leadership or leading with heart is this the same thing but not said that way i love the idea of being like, really aggressive because i think like when we think about recognition it is said that employees will not remember, I'm pretty sure any of us won't remember, we won't remember if it's been more than a week when someone's recognized us. Mm -hmm. It's a week. 
it's kind of scary. But if it's happening all the time, it, it just like our coworkers and our friends and our team, and we're getting it all the time, we're getting the boost all the time, we're filling up all the time. And who wants to leave an environment where we're feeling up and good about ourselves mm-hmm. often? I mean, yeah. that's that's really the question. And then the other way around is like that time, the times where no one ever says I've done a good job. Mm-hmm. And I want to go somewhere where I feel like I'm doing a good job often. So yeah. you bring a really good point up, you know, <laughs> really. Yeah. I talk well, I mean, about, you talk about this all the time, but it's just, it's just sometimes when it comes, when it's said from you coming to me and the way you did it, it just hit me in such a profound way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to, well, I'm trying to give credit to the speaker who said it, but like, has anyone ever come to you and be like, oh, I'm getting too much praise. Maybe John Acuff. That sounds like very John Acuffy. But like, I'm getting too much praise right now. I don't, I can't handle anymore. Please stop. Like, that's not a thing that happens. <laughs> and so, yeah, definitely like building that up and being intentional about it is, will definitely help wherever you work or your family too. Like I, we were doing this thing, my wife and I, cause everybody needs a little bit of marriage mentorship every once in a while. <laughs> and, um, and so uh, I even made like a little game out of it. We, so there's this older couple that we meet with and my wife happily married 22 years Uh, And there's a couple that's been happily married 42 years. And so, um, and so we go, they, you know, take them to lunch sometime at some, they're super healthy. Like I'm not like, I will get pizza all the time, but, um, and so uh, they were, they're just saying, you know, just try to, you know, or the, 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 the guy was telling me, Hey, just try to see if you can compliment her more around in front of other people. Mm -hmm. And so we went on this Thanksgiving trip and I would just talk her up in front of our kids. We've got teenage girls. We've got four kids. You got four kids. So we have teenage girls and then we got twin six-year-olds. And so just talking up, hey, mom did a great job picking out the restaurant. We did a great job picking out this Airbnb where we're staying and um, and just, or just doing something different. It's the first time we've ever done like just our own, like six of us for Thanksgiving. That's always been, we've always hosted it for like 15 mm-hmm. years. And so it was kind of like a break. And just like figuring out ways, like being intentional about talking up my wife to my kids, which sometimes we're like, well, they know I love her but it does help to hear it. And it helped her to hear it too. Aww. Cause I think these things, but I don't always say them, which is kind of done by me. You might as well get credit for what you're thinking. So, um, you know, that's, that's a good thing to do too. I love the, I love the, I love what you're doing here. I um, just re- was recently speaking to s- as someone who was, uh, was on a planning committee with one of my um, engagements and, and it was a gentleman when you don't usually hear this, but I know we'd hear it if it's you again, cause you're, you're way unique this way, but this gentleman, um, so he leads, this like really big, huge healthcare organization. And he says to me, we're talking about listening. I want to, I don't want to, I want to make sure that we also talk about, I want them to know that I want them to also listen at at home too. Like, it was just like, I, it was such a rarity to have a man. That's really, it's it's true to have a man say, Heather, I know why we're talking about, like, we want to make sure that they're talking to their vendor partners or talking to their, you know, hospital, this and that and that. But I want us to be very clear that I want them to take these skills and the things that you talk about with them. And I want them to also listen more to their spouse and listen more to their significant others. And listen, I want them to do that. And I was like, dang, I'm, I, like, I already know this guy's coming on my show because again, you don't usually get people better that way. I know that I pick them out. Um, I can see that those, those little bits of kind of greatness and people where most people may like just brush over it or not think much of it. I think that's pretty spectacular. You know, and that you're that you personally too are aware enough to like number one, aware enough and a willingness to change, which I know all that stems together with this like curiosity thing, this learner, lifetime learner thing that you have in you. But um having the awareness to say, I'm gonna change with my wife, like that this is still all leadership at heart. This is all showing up with care and concern for others. Like, how do I make sure that, that person knows I appreciate them? And it's in any place. And I, I think that that's the one thing I've actually evolved in a lot in these last several, I think kids have done it for me for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, having the four and having these, gosh, these adults that I'm looking at going, these are adults now, they're adults. And I, it's crazy who they're turning out to be. But when I think about this term leadership, I think, I, I think I'm going more to where you're talking about what you're saying, which is this, you know, that person who's the, the wisdom part of it, I think is big, the curiosity part, the how much am I showing up this particular way for anyone who's in my circle? Mm-hmm. I don't care if it's the person who's cleaning. Like, so I have some, I I do, I just, the last couple of years brought someone in to start cleaning the house every couple of weeks. And it's actually, she was someone who was with me 20 years ago, then stop, then start, then stop, start. It's kind of mm-hmm. like waves, right? Well, I just love it. I just, you know, we have a really close bond. 
but she had something happen to her eye recently and it's been really bad and she's had multiple surgeries and this detachment. And so we've been, so she's been like, Heather, you know, you've done so much for me. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? Like, I just, you just come clean my house. Like I haven't done anything for you. And I'm like, I, you've done so much for me. And like, I just see her as so valuable. And so I'm like, yeah, I'm going to pray for you. And oh, how are you doing? And how is that? I, and da, 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 is there anything else I can do for you? Like, this is what I'm saying to her, the person who cleans my house. And she's saying, well, how can I do for you? But I think that's <laughs> kind of the point is that we can all do things for each other in the spaces that we're in. And it might sound squishy to say that, but I think in the end, like all these other things we want, like loyalty, uh, connections, like more relation, better relationships, uh, whatever it is that we're trying to get to, mm -hmm. we get there by trying to meet the needs of the people that are in front of us at the moment, no matter their title, no matter who they are. Right. And then, like the, the world just opens up, like then we just get more. So we don't need to worry about what we get because we just get more by being more present and more willing to give to others that are around us. Like you're doing what yeah. your wife is doing, for example. Yeah, right? yeah, number. no, yeah, she's doing awesome. And I, I don't know if we talked about this here, but this woman with three kids, um, uh, what adoption and taking in and then has a has a baby on the way, lost lost everything. Her neighbors that were actually killed behind them and lost everything in a tornado and still haven't gotten money from their insurance place. And so my wife got everybody to take a collection. We've rented a U-Haul, I think about 20 minutes ago. And uh, we're taking that up there tomorrow uh, with all these friends and everything. So it's a it's a big group effort. My wife's kind of spearheading, but like so many people, and they're used to us doing that. When we, we had the big thing, the Nashville flood here, our little girls were who were, I think, think three and four at the time. So the Nashville flood, if you don't, a lot of people don't know, but it was massive. It put the entire like Opryland Hotel, if you've been there, that was underwater. The Opryland Mall was underwater. They had videos of of semi trucks floating down the interstate, and um, and it took out huge chunks of Nashville. And so our little girls, Sydney, um, who's uh, our super precocious number two daughter, and then our very mathy older daughter would go around with a wagon to all our neighbors and get stuff from them. I'd, I'd be watching from, you know, from the yeah. sidewalk, but they wanted to do it. So they go up. And so everybody's used to putting stuff on our front porch. So like our neighbors will do it. We have friends who do it. Like our French port front porch has junk on it. Like nearly every time there's a tornado somewhere or collecting stuff for, you know, the Alabama had tornadoes. We live in tornado alley here kind mm. of in Tennessee. And so people are so used to that. So now the more you do that, the more people give because they trust us because they they realize it's going somewhere. Like they don't go and see their stuff in our house a month later. Um, but, you know, teaching our kids to do that, like when there's a disaster, you go and help. Like for, for me as a little kid, we went through times where we were the ones, it wasn't so much from a disaster, but my parents got divorced and my dad came back at the end. So there's a happy ending there, but was gone for like a decade. So, uh, you know, single mom, four kids. So like when you go and donate food to places, so like we would go to church and I'd they it was just a little country church and they had this wooden box in front of the sanctuary door going in. Yeah. And I would go by there like, mom, that looks just like our food. She's like, yep, yep. And it was that we were people getting the food. And then sometimes we get like these bags of clothes that people just donate. Right. And that's what we wore to school. And so we had all those times where we were the ones that did it. And so now it's kind of funny. There's this nonprofit that we work with locally here. And so one of the dumb things, like I'm not obsessed with... Um, hmm. Nilla wafers, but I just remember my neighbors would have Nilla wafers. And when people donate food, like try and donate some nice stuff occasionally. Whenever, like when you donate food, you're like, oh, we need to get as much food as possible. We're going to get the cheapest, yes. worst kind. So you get like the black, we used to have bag yes. cereal, like just the bag cereal. And so, uh, like I, my friends, we'd get vanilla wafers that were like in a generic box and our neighbors would have Nilla wafers. And so like, I joke around like every once in a while, I'll make sure, Hey, can you throw in some Nilla wafers? So my <laughs> friend, Regina Harvey, who's with this awesome, uh, ministry here in Nashville, um, where they help like women with financial stuff, but they also do mm -hmm. feeding to get them through. And so, uh, she goes, yeah, I got some, so she'll take pictures with Nilla wafers every once in a while to give to them. And so um, it's one of those fun things, like so that stuff comes back around. Like now I get to be the one of those people that goes and helps people, but we were the ones that got help first, you know? Yes. And so it is kind of a cool thing to just see that continuously going and and making up and, and making a difference. So I call, uh, I, my definition of caring leadership is showing concern and kindness to, to, towards those who look to you for guidance. Mm -hmm. And so I, if you notice, it doesn't say anything about authority or title or bureaucracy or level, or there's nothing, none of that. I mean, you happen to have title president, uh, right, at, at Premier, but that's not why, that's not why I chose you, though, actually. Um, and <laughs> What's it was funny, I didn't, I didn't have it, my, 
I'm so bad with titles. Um, I, I forgot for like a year and a half to yeah. update it on LinkedIn and my mom. So my mom life, my mom's a nurse. So she was a nurse 40 years. And so she would work like when we were kids, if you were on a team, she'd get by the pin and put the pin on her thing and walk around. And, um, and so she wants an opportunity to brag on her kids at any time. And so, uh, and so she's like, you've been president for a year and a half and you didn't tell me, I'm like, I didn't think about it. Like I forgot. And I think I was 2016. I'm not sure what year, but I, so I just had kind of like a title is not, it's what you do really, but it's just kind of funny. Like premier and everybody here, like Sean is Sean's our CEO and you will like, he actually is a really smart guy. He tries to come off as like a, like a goofy Texan, but then he's really smart. And then we have people who kind of hide their stuff. So like Chris is our CIO uh, and he wants to come off as this is this evil curmudgeon like that's what he's really going for and he's not he's not old he's and he has a justin timberlake vibe of just justin timberlake where this this uh really grouchy old man that's the vibe he's going for even though i don't know if he's 40 yet um but he actually has this big heart and shauna has this big heart and so even if people have these different personas mm. of being like a, a big border collie or like a grouchy <laughs> old man they um there actually are smart people who try to look out for each other and it's just kind of continuous even if it's in it which is not really thought of as warm and fuzzy yep or ceo who has to do mean stuff occasionally or, or hard stuff occasionally so it's it's kind of having that throughout that really helps out mm, i love that well i think you got i mean you have to kind of do that. It's that whole like rolling up the sleeves. People love that. They respect that. And if we if we get too full of our own selves or like, you know, like I say, like drink our own Kool-Aid or something, uh, which can be in my role as a speaker who's on stages, I can get super easy to be the person who drinks your own Kool-Aid. Mm -hmm. Seriously. Luckily, my Kool-Aid is about caring for other people and caring for myself. <laughs> so luckily- That's like, good Kool-Aid to have. It's a good Kool-Aid to have, exactly. But the, yeah. you know, sometimes you can be, you know, you need to, you need to be humbled and all those things that need to happen in, inside of all that in that space, right? So, um, I think it's important to do that. I I don't know about you, but uh, and I do. Well, I know this is you like to make sure that you stay stay like grounded and stuff as well. And I think for me, and as we think about like ourselves as leaders, it's kind of it's kind of saying to ourselves, what do we what do what do we say we value most? Like, what's the thing? Like, if we think about a memory of the people who've been the kindest to us or that we love the most or whatever, we say we value it. Boy, we really want to be more like that. Are we really more like that? So that congruency thing. And I'm. It is a huge focus of mine. Like, I'm just constantly going. Okay, that that wasn't very caring ish, or that wasn't very like whatever that that wasn't very soft and squishy and like whatever I say I am, I wasn't that way. And so it's like. What do I need to do? I'm like, well, wait, how should I back away from this? Do I need to go apologize to people? Do I need, like, I'm constantly discerning that. That is, you know, just who I am too from a faith-based person perspective, but it also who I was born to be. But there's right. that constant thing of like introspection of, of that thing. And it's so funny to be that person and be the person that like, that people put me, like I'm on stages. It's, it's, it's a very interesting place to be. And so I'm just constantly struggling with that. And I think as leaders, we kind of just do that. Like people who are, we have people that look to us for guidance in some way, our kids, our uh, people that are on our team. And we're constantly kind of going, we're, we're, we're kind of, we're, we're between that. Or we should be, I kind of feel like we should be. I was telling somebody today, I feel like we should be kind of doing this. Because if we are always just like, hmm, I, it's smooth, it's clear, it's fine. I never have any doubt. You know, I feel like we are not going to be the relatable people or the people that, that, that people will look to or want to follow, right? Mm -hmm. I, yeah. You can't always be the person who has it all, all the answers. Yeah, yeah. Right? And you got to seek occasionally or something I think is really good is say, I don't know. Or or even it, or even the hedge one, like my clients and my kid, or not so much clients, but uh, my kids and coworkers hear me say, I'd rather know than guess all mm. the time. So like, so we got to figure that out. You bet, it's better to know than guess. And so like that comes up all the time. And um, of just being humble and saying, I don't know, but at least I'll go find out and and kind of going from that. And so I've had people like, even though they know I'm a big nerd, there's they know there's a lot of stuff I don't know. And so I'll say, OK, I don't I don't know that. And then they're like, oh, and there's a little lightening up. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, as, as long as they haven't met me doing like Trivial Pursuit or something like that. Like, well, you, yeah. okay. So who are some of the coolest people you've interviewed? Because you actually, like, you know, <laughs> you know a lot. You know actually more than most of us because first you either go seek out more information and or you go seek people who know the information and or you listen to the people who know a lot. So who are the coolest people? Because you've interviewed, I'm talking about like 
coolest people meaning like high profile don't say well heather you're really cool i'm not talking about that i'm talking about <laughs> i'm talking about like astronauts like tell some tell us some of the people you've interviewed um, on your podcast well i mean one of the cool ones was i got to like this one speaker i booked in the most and he said hey do you want to go to the nba all-star game in la and i got to go to the uh prayer breakfast because he helped start the prayer breakfast pat williams and so i kind of looked lost apparently walking in and this extremely tall uh, a black woman came in. She goes, you look lost. Come sit by me. And it was Shaq's mom. <gasps> and so she had what? me sit by her and she looks, they look a lot alike. Like you, like you see him, you're like, you're Shaq's mom. You're Mark Jackson's mom. You're, you're like, so Mark, I went, I'm, I'm from Indiana. So Mark Jackson was like the point guard there. So I was, I was excited to meet Mark Jackson's mom as Shaq's mom. But anyway, she was super nice. So I got to, so I used that, like I booked Shaq to speak a few years later. And, um, and I, so I, the whole interview is about him and his mom and stuff oh. he's learned from her because he doesn't like talking about mom and his mom was, she actually was legitimately nice. It wasn't like a ploy. Like she was really nice and they sat with me and talked to him and, and he's like, who did you, who did you, like, he wanted to make sure he's like, who was she sitting with? And I told you, okay, yeah, you were actually there. You were just <laughs> making it up. And, um, so, I mean, that was really cool. Um, when I was a high schooler, I got to go on a visit to DePaul where I eventually went to college and, um, uh, what's the i just did this interview my brain i wasn't planning on talking about this stuff here uh but he is the guy who does ken burns so i got to ask him some questions so in a way when i was a high schooler he was my first interviewer or interview and then 30 years later i just got to interview him so that was really fascinating because i love history i'm a big history junkie and some interesting questions about like do people have shorter attention spans and his he was like no people binge watch stuff you just have to make it interesting people don't have shorter attention spans and so that was interesting to, from a guy who does these hours long documentaries. So that was interesting. And then just people with, with crazy stories of, um, you know, Yossi Ginsberg. What's funny, I met up with him. So he was, so uh, the guy who plays Harry Potter played him in the movie, which is funny because Yossi Ginsberg's like six, four and the super famous guy who plays in the movie. I'm not a huge Harry Potter guy played him. Who's maybe like five, five or five, six. But anyway, so I met up with Yossi at the Gaylord Opryland, second time in this interview, Gaylord Opryland. And Yossi was late. And he goes, I've been lost twice in my life. Once was for 21 days in the Amazon. And the other time was today in the Gaylord Opryland, which anybody who's been there, they're not that different. They're just giant <laughs> plants everywhere. And so, um, so, I mean, that one was fascinating, but I love stories. So my whole thing with this mm -hmm. is like, sometimes you have to do interviews that are for you know, for work that you have to do. But I really kind of my gauge is you always want to have like uh, a, an audience member. Like when you do it, if you do an audience, if your audience is everyone, it's going to be a bad interview. If your audience is for one person, like sometimes I'll interview somebody and I'm like, what would my wife want to know? And I'll do that. So a lot of times my audience is me. Like what's the most interesting, curious thing for me? And then I'll do that interview as opposed mm. to let's talk about your five different speech topics and how you customize. Like I will throw in like, how do you customize for the financial industry? But a lot of it is, is kind of that origin story or where they brought in. And then you try to do this, the interviews like an arc so that it, it does have that beginning, middle end with kind of those interesting things, but you wrap it up, like making them a human. Like, what do you, mm. what have you learned about this? That you actually teach to your kids. Like, you know, that's one of my sort of a, a, a question that I end a lot of the interviews with just because I think like you're talking about, you can have these things, how does it apply to the business, but how can you apply this to your family? And if you if you are good with your family, your business will do better. If your family life is, is terrible, you'll do worse at work. So um, like, I honestly do want people to get better for having listened to or watched the interviews that that we do here. And, and it does help, like you have a great team. I know you're talking about your person, like Eric Woody's mine. Like he does a phenomenal job with these and like kind of crafting them. Like I'll be like, oh, can you move this question around because I did it out of order and, or it just came up in the wrong place. So, yeah, I'll do that. It's like having those great people really help out. But I think just having that idea when you go into an interview of having that, having that arc so that it ties in and people can really latch onto certain things is really helpful in actually having it make an impact instead of just like hearing yourself talk. I am curious to know, I mean, we really haven't broached on like, how do you lead a team? Things like that, which I'm not, I'm fine. I don't, I'm actually don't want to do that here. But one thing I am curious about is, and this is like something I do do on every, every episode is I want you to think about a time um, when maybe, because it's obvious, I think to me, it's because I've been watching you from afar. And I mean, people listen to you now that you have a big heart, like that you lead with heart, that you show up with heart, that like you try to do the right thing. Your faith is definitely a North Star. Is there a time for you that when you felt like maybe you didn't lead this way, like you weren't you weren't the leader you are now, 
Can you think of kind of a time when you were, weren't, either it's a specific time or a time in your life when you weren't? And then what did you do to come out on the other side? Like, was there uh, some kind of trigger? Was there something that kind of made you go, I really choose to be this person today? Anything you want to share with us? Yeah, I mean, I think growing up, so I would occasionally try to prove how smart I was. Like I, so when I was a little kid, we didn't have cable for a while, but somebody, somehow we got like these used encyclopedias. So I would just read them. I just go read S, you know, whatever it was. And S is like two parts because there's so many things to start with S. So I would just read encyclopedias cover to cover. So I would, and, and my grandma would pay me two bucks for every either Newbery award winning or classic that I'd read. So like second grade, I'm reading like Tale of Two Cities. So I was knew a lot of stuff and, and, and I was trying to save up to buy an Atari, which was 50 bucks, but I kept on spending my $2 on like baseball cards and candy. So I never got to that level, but a lot of times I would be in classes and I might actually know more than teachers would know. And I would get really obnoxious with <laughs> maybe not totally obnoxious. Like I think I've always been to some extent nice and look after people, but I could also use, use my powers for evil and, um, and making other people look bad or look silly uh, or uh, just not being the best person. And there was a time, like I switched schools. I went from this little tiny school to a great big school where nobody knew who I was. And it was, it was not fun, but um, somewhere probably that where it became intentional was somewhere in college. I don't, I'm trying to remember what it was, but it was like, are people better for having known you? Like, do are people better off from having come and contact you or or worse off or or just nothing? And so I remember coming in at probably early 20s, like, I want people to be better off for having known me. Like if if they they came in contact with with me, are they a better person? And then if you want to do that, how do you intentionally get better at helping people get better? And because with me, a lot of times I get big into ideas or achieving things. And so I'm very good at being friendly, but not awesome at being a friend. And so I can, I wanted to be more intentional about that. And so for me, it, I'm still am geared to accomplish things and to, um, to do those things, but how can you do that in a good way? So like, if you make a podcast, are you trying to go win some own award which is not bad if you do win an award, or are you trying to, are people going to be better for having listened to it? Are people going to be better? Are they going to finish an article that you read and be like, oh, that guy's smart. Or they're like, oh, I can actually use that. I'm going to, my, I'm going to be a better father for having read that. Um, and just even at work, like are people, like there were times when Premiere was really small and I was the agent who was bringing like 80% of it. And that's not because I was great. It's because like, we really didn't have many, anybody here. And like, there's that huge pressure is, are these people going to be able to make rent if I, mm -hmm. I need to go out and book enough? And so, I mean, that's not the case now. Premiere is much bigger than it was, you know, 20, 20 some years ago, but like just having that attitude are people better for having known me. And I'm, I'm a lot better for having known a lot of people like, and that's mm -hmm. part of where the, it's the other side of that curiosity. Like I am so much better because the people that have had an influence on me, whether they knew it or not. And for me, it is being intentional. Like I love coaching. So I coach. I just finished basketball and, I, and I'm coaching my daughter's softball team and I coached my other daughter's softball team for years and years. And so like you go into that, what do they know? Like, are they better? Like the thing, like to get kids uh, attention, uh, like a lot of teams will go Marco and the kids yell back Polo. I'm like, we can do better than that. So ours is, I'll say, if I mess up and they have to yell back, I don't give up. And mm. if they say, if I mess up, I don't give up a thousand times over a year of a spring and a fall season, that'll sink in. And the other thing, like teaching like five, six, seven year old girls, um, I can do hard things. Be like, you can't catch a ball back in right now. Like no, like hardly any six year olds can catch mm -hmm. a ball back in. They'll do this little, this little catch thing right here. <laughs> can't catch back in. Like you can do hard things. Keep working at it. You can do hard things. And then just the other stuff too, like being able to, um, like they shake hands with umpires. So I, I didn't learn how to shake hands until I was in, it was like student council. They had somebody who came by and taught us how to shake hands the right way. Like my dad was in the picture. Who's going to teach me this stuff. And so they did like the whole thing. Like you meet thumb to thumb, like web and you shake and you look them in the eye. And so I start teaching girls this, they go up to the umpire and the other coach. So if you teach a five, six, seven year old girl, how to confidently shake hands. And she does that for five or six years. When she does her first job interview, they're going to be like, this girl's amazing. And so just having those little things, are they better? That's a simple one. And that's not, not a lot of stuff. Isn't even softball. Like they'll get better at softball and we win championships and stuff. But the big thing is, are they a better person? Can they work better with their parents? 
you know, and, and can they work better with other adults? And a lot of those girls, I think do get better because, and I coach my son now, I finally got through first, first season of basketball with him, but having three daughters, you go through a lot of that stuff first. Those girls are more confident. They can do a lot more. They're not going to be scared because a lot of umps are big guys, like they're former athletes. So you get up this big, you know, six, four guy with a Fu Manchu and you're like shaking hands with them, like an eight-year-old girl, like when, when else is an eight-year-old girl going to do that? Mm -hmm. And so it is kind of fun to see them. They are getting better for having done that, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's looking for those opportunities to help people get that right mindset. I know you talk about mindset, about doing stuff at home, like getting, like you talk about setting yourself up for success or, or, um, doing that process. And then once you do that, you can lead others. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, even though the end goal is others, the first two steps, like you point out, are are developing yourself. And so I think those girls, they learn how to do that themselves and they can go and make a big impact on the world. Mm, I love that so much. And that's like generational care and concern. I mean, there's just so many ways to peel that back and and just a great um, message for all of us today, number one, just thinking about the impacts we have at home, in our communities, um, how care extends outside the workplace, outside ourselves, but has to start with us first, as, which it does with you. And there's that introspection that says, like, how, am, how do I get better? How am I aware of my impacts to others around me? I love that idea of just thinking about what is my impact to those around me? Like, are people better? Are people worse off? These are all things that for those listening right now, we should be, we could ponder and do uh, all of us do a better job at as well. Um, so for those who are listening right now, and what might be like your besides there's always been already been so much goodness on this conversation, what might be a couple pearls of wisdom you'd leave them with? Like something that is, is it that could be somebody at a crossroads in your leadership, someone who's thinking there's change happening in their life, a change happening at work, and they they could just be at a crossroads. What might be a couple pearls of wisdom you'd leave them with? Well, I mean, I was I'm gonna borrow yours. I just listened to whatever the the one is. So like taking care of yourself first. So I, this guy came in to me, he's like, how are you still in the basic thing is like, how are you still in shape? Like I'll be 50 next year and people are like, oh, you're gonna be fit. And so, uh, one of the things is like every single day I start off exercising. So like since March 15th, 2020, so I was pretty good before, but I started tracking it. So I got a, the worst stomach bug of my life in September of 2022. And I missed a few days, but every otherwise every single day for for four years now, I've worked out every single day, even as five, 10 minutes. Wow. So I didn't miss a day in 2023. I haven't missed one now. I didn't miss anything in 2020 after that, even having COVID, worked out through COVID, worked out through strep throat, worked out everything else. And so it's just keeping that up because I know I need to be like, I've got little kids. I'm going to need to be a great dad for a long time. And my mom's been a great example. She was a nurse. She goes, you have to treat yourself like a professional athlete. So every single day I wake up, First thing I do, and that helps me uh, is go out, I either run or bike. I used to swim. I'm kind of bad swimmer, but I'll do one of those two things. And then occasionally I'll throw in something at lunch. So like 400 workouts a year. And so um, keeping that up and I do events and everything else. I'm not the fastest, but it is kind of fun to go and travel and do those kind of races and that sort of thing, uh, like duathlons and triathlons. And uh, so that is starting your day right. And you can think about those things. Like you were talking about mindset you know, taking the Heather Younger cue here is that that gives you, cause I don't do running anyway with headphones or anything like that. And, um, just being able to think through those things, like how am I going to work through this problem? What questions are, am I going to ask this person, um, you know, or prayer or whatever it is, you know, read a verse before you go and you think about, you know, Ephesians 4, 32, whatever it is. And so you go through and do those things. That's how you start your day. And then the, how you end your day. So I used to get, I don't know if you ever get it, but that, that headache that comes up through your shoulder blade and goes up through the back of your head. I get those, I used to get those headaches all the time where it's oh. kind of like your shoulders and everything. Yes. And so, and so now before I go to bed, I have a really set another thing out of COVID because I'm like, COVID is going to be terrible. Like you could tell early on COVID wasn't going to be fun. And like, how can I control myself, what I'm going through right now? And, um, and so working out, I can control working out. Doesn't matter what the weather is out loud, outside, anything else, I can at least work out on a treadmill inside. And so, and then how can I end my day? Am I going to end my day positively or negatively? So I stretch for like two minutes every day. I do like 25 sit-ups and like 25 supermans, which is like your, your lower back. And like I ever, I end every night like that. I used to get those headaches all the time, like the shoulder blade headaches. And now I stretch my arms across and everything. And I stretch, I don't get those headaches anymore. Like, I don't know, my Advil is losing money on me now. And so <laughs> it's, um, so, I mean, just taking those things in because everybody's got their own specific things, how to deal with them. 
But if you can handle yourself, like you're, you were talking about in your, your latest podcast episode is just, if you can take care of yourself first, you know, take care of your home. Like we talked about that, take care of yourself physically. Um, you know, like I was telling a dad, uh, my assistant coach on the basketball team. And, um, he's like, I'm 10 years younger than you, but I look older. And part of his thing is like, he's, he's like, I'm so focused on work and providing for my family that I can't take care of myself. I'm like, you can, you, you will. Cause the thing is, is if you work out and exercise, you will have more energy. Um, there's the one book I'm trying to remember what it's called, but the whole thing is it's not managing time. It's managing energy. And if you work out, you will have more energy. So if you spend, you know, half hour, 20 minutes working out a day, you will get much more done that day than the other days. And so I think it's just taking care of yourself. And if you can do that, you'll have more energy to help other people's problems. You'll have more energy to be a great mom or a dad or, or sister, brother, whatever it is. And, you know, you can really meet those challenges head on and make a bigger impact. And it's not being selfish to take care of yourself. It's being kind of selfish not to. Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, I, that would be kind of my thing to, to, if you're trying to talk to leaders on how to meet problems or how to meet issues, get yourself some energy and, and you kind of go at it that way. And eating's the thing too. Like I do a little, a little tracker and I found out like the, the, the unholy Trinity for me, if I want to gain weight, the three things I would eat are French fries, potato chips, and sweet sour chicken. Like I will, I'm guaranteed to gain weight the next day if I eat that. And then you find other things you can eat. Like I can eat pizza. It doesn't affect me. Weird. I don't know how. Oh gosh. Pizza, right. Totally fine. But, um, and, but you, tra you only know that for your tracking. So anyway, that's, I don't know. I, that's stuck in my head is like stuff. Like if I were to give leaders advice, maybe just cause I was just talking to a, a dad, that, and awesome guy, awesome guy, but he's, he's kind of, you know, doesn't focus on the health stuff. I'm like, you want to be a dad, a good dad for a long time. There's a shortage of good dads. You need to be a good dad. You mm -hmm. need to keep it up. And so great guy. And that's, uh, that's my advice to him. Maybe somebody else needs that too. Mm, I appreciate that. And for those listening, I mean, so thank you, Brian, for giving us that like boost of reality here and uh, level <laughs> setting where we really should just let's, let's just recenter on this idea of self-care and caring for us and focusing on us first and then leading others. I think that's a big one. And there's just so much goodness there. So just thank you for bringing all that goodness to the world uh, with or without a title, right? Because it's all about how you show up and the guidance and the concern and the care that you show other people and you do that naturally. And so thanks for being a great example for us to follow with that. And so for those who are listening, please do share this because I think the world needs more of this goodness. And and don't forget to just share it far and wide. And again, uh, Brian, yeah, yeah, so glad I just pulled Jen and said, come here, you're coming with me. <laughs> Well, it's been a pl it's been awesome. I'm I'm I've had fun uh, doing this. I don't get to do it too often, so it's kind of fun to to share these things in platform and learn from you with this stuff. I love the framework you've got, and uh, and I hope someday I grow up to a point where I can get your uh, your intro music. That would be awesome. <laughs> oh, I love it. Thanks, Brian, and thanks everybody for listening to the Leadership with Heart podcast. Be well. <laughs>